prophet Samuel was uh, sent by God to Jesse's house to, with an assignment. And that assignment was to anoint the next king of Israel. And as the prophet Samuel was there with Jesse, he looked at the strongest son and said, certainly this is the one, this is the one. As he looked at the countenance, the outward expression and impression of someone, he said, this has got to be the one. And God made a tremendous proclamation that all of us ought to pay attention to. As a matter of fact, if you have your Bible tonight, open to the book of 1 Samuel. 1 Samuel, we find an incredible truth that God reflects to the prophet, and uh, I think it would do us well in our world today to take heed to the instruction that God gave the prophet. And so when you look there together in chapter 16 of 1 Samuel, you will see in verse number 7 the truth that everyone ought to have marked in their Bible. As a matter of fact, if you get in my Bible uh, and you begin to work your way through my Bible, you will find that when you get to 1 Samuel chapter 16, verse number 7, it's highlighted in yellow. Uh, there is a profound truth that we all should personalize in our life in verse number 7. But the Lord said to Samuel, Look not on his countenance, nor on the height of his stature, because I have refused him. For the Lord sees not as a man sees. Would you read the next part with me? For man looks on the outward appearance, but the Lord looks on the heart. But the Lord said to Samuel, Look not on his countenance, nor on the height of his stature, because I have refused him. For the Lord sees not as a man sees. For man will always make the mistake of looking on the outward appearance. But the Lord looks on the heart. And after you read that passage of Scripture, you begin to realize that repetitively, Jesse brings his other sons to pass by the prophet Samuel, and God says, that's not the one, that's not the one, that's not the one. And all of a sudden, you begin to realize that what God was doing, and, and I want you to think about this, God was turning each one of those inside out. So tonight, I want you, if you're taking notes, and I hope that you are, we don't have an outline tonight, and I know that's going to freak some of you out. But I want you to think about inside out. Everybody say that with me. What? Inside out. Because you see, if we're going to be effective, and we're going to be used of the Lord, what God may require is to turn you inside out. That, that man may look out here, but God says, no, I see something different than that. I, I don't see just the outward projection of that person, but I'm going to turn them inside out, and I'm going to look at their heart. Here's the question. What if God did that to you? What if God said to you, i tell you what I'm going to do. I'm going to turn you inside out. Before I can take you outside in, I'm going to turn you inside out. What if God were to take you and all of a sudden in a transformable way, he were to say tonight, what I'm going to do with every person here before I let you out these doors, I'm going to turn you inside out. I'm going to do an inside job on you. I'm going to look deep within your heart. Here's the question. If God were to do that, what would he see? What would he see tonight if he did that? Let's pray together. Father, tonight we thank you that, God, you're able to look beyond just what we present. 
That God, you're a God that no matter what we may do or what we may try to be, God, you see deeper than that. And Lord, tonight, we are grateful, Lord, that even though men may see what they want to see and their perception is their reality, but God, we know that when you look, the reality is the reality. There is no mistaking about that. And God, I'm so thankful tonight that as the prophet went to do a work that you've asked him to do, that you was wise enough you was wise enough, even though the prophet and all the people around him may have said, oh, this is the one. You said, no, I refused him. I refused him. That does not mean, God, that you have rejected him. But what that does mean is that you have a position, a, a plan for certain things to happen. And God, you have to have the right person and you have to have the heart in the right place in order to use them in a right way. And so God, tonight, I want to ask, Lord, that as we open your word, that tonight you will speak to us as we begin a journey tonight, a journey talking about inside out. And God, I pray that tonight, I, I know that, that this is a holiday weekend. I know that there's a lot of people that's all out busy, but God, for those of us that are here tonight, Lord, would you turn us inside out? In Jesus' name we pray. And all of God's people said, amen. amen. Do you have your Bible there? Do you have it with you? Say amen if you do. Do you have it open to 1 Samuel 17? If you do, say amen. Let's look at verse number 7 again, and let's all read the last part of that together. Are you ready? Here we go. For man looketh on the outward appearance but the Lord looks on the what if God looked on your heart tonight what if God were to turn you inside out and were to examine you from the inside out what would he see with you what would God see do you love the Lord do you really love God I mean do you really love God are you really connected with him? Do you have a passion that drives you to another level of your spiritual journey because you love God? Have you become lukewarm and callous? Are you just going through the motions? Have you lost the sense of who he is? Are you in a place in your life that when God were to look on the inside of you and examine your heart, would he see someone that's authentic and real and passionate and loving him and desiring to know him? Would he see a person that is deeply in love with him or maybe just maybe you have forgotten who he is maybe you're going through the motions of church maybe you're going through the motions of religion maybe maybe even maybe even your God has become your novelty maybe God is not who he used to be to you maybe Maybe somehow, some way, you've gotten off track, and maybe tonight you need to realign your heart with God. Is it possible that tonight, as we open the Word of God, that already the Spirit of the living God is already beginning to convict us, no matter whether we're pastors, preachers, deacons, teachers, no matter who we are, maybe, just maybe, the Spirit of the living God has already begun to convict you because there was a time in your life that you weren't just going through the motions. There was a time in your life to where there was a real sense of intimacy between you and God, but somewhere along the journey, that has subsided. Maybe everybody sees what you do on the outside. Maybe everybody sees you pull in the parking lot. Everybody sees you go to class. Everybody sees you go through the motions. Everybody sees you stand and, and maybe even utter words of a song. Maybe, maybe, maybe you're going through, maybe you're doing what you always do, but... If the truth be known, if God were to turn you inside out, he would see a vacancy in your heart when it really comes to loving Jesus. I was telling our deacons earlier tonight that we'll be getting out of here going to the land of Haiti at the end of July. And, and every year I do, not, I do not invite myself to go do a crusade. That's not who I am. I don't call them up and go, you want me to show up and preach and all that stuff. That's not what I do. But the land and the leaders of where we're going to be going in the city of Lakai has officially introduced and invited us to come again and especially for me to come and preach a crusade. And I do not dictate to them what what that's all about. I don't ask them. I don't bring something there. And, and when they wrote me the letter, they, they asked for me to come in and be used of God to bring a crusade to that land. And when they asked me to preach on the subject, I was really taken back. And this was the subject. 
bring revival to the land, the land of Haiti. And I thought, oh my goodness, bring revival to the land of Haiti. I'm going to be going into a place where you cannot get a seat. There's going to be hundreds of people there. People are going to be packed into a building like sardines. They're going to walk for miles up dusty, dirty roads. They're, they're, going to, they're going to braid the environment. They're not going to drive up in their Cadillacs. They're not going to come in their, in their cars. They're, they're not going to do that. They're going to walk and walk and walk, and there's no electricity, and there's no street lights to go home. And they're going to come to a church, and there's going to be hundreds of them there. They're going to have to get there early just to get a seat in the building. There's going to be hundreds of people standing on the outside. And, and, and when I thought about that, I thought, my, soul. You really want me to come and preach on bringing a revival to the land of Haiti when, when you have church services you cannot get in. They know how to worship. They sing from their heart. They're not just mumbling words on the screen. They don't have great sound systems. They don't have great instruments, but their heart is so attached to worshiping God that when you walk in the building, you can feel the electricity from the worship. Contrary to coming to the land of America. We have all the nice stuff and all the right things. And we have all the newest equipment. But yet at the same time, we've lost our passion for God. Could it be that God needs to turn you inside out? Could it be that God is going, you know what, I'm not going to receive what you're trying to give to me. I have refused you. Because man is looking at all your outside stuff, but I am God, and I know how to look beyond that. I know how to dig deep into your heart and into your life, and I know how to examine you where nobody else can examine you. I'm going to examine your heart. What if God were to do that to you? When I thought about that, I thought, my soul. You see, when you think about serving God and passionately knowing God and connecting with God and really getting on fire for God and realizing that there comes a time in all of our lives, it doesn't matter who we are, there comes a time in all of our lives where we need to get back and humble ourselves before God and we need to lay on the examining altar of God and say, Lord, you know what? Tonight, it's not about everybody else. It's not about that. But God, tonight, it's about me laying myself bare before you on the altar and saying, God, look in here. Look in here. And I'm going to tell you something, and I'm just going to be very blunt. When I look at our church, I see people who were once on fire for God but now you're going through the motions. I see people that once had a passion for God that when you came in, there was a fire that was burning in your heart, but now maybe, maybe not so much so for you. Let me ask you a question. If God were to turn you inside out, what would he see? So tonight, take your Bible now and turn to Matthew. Because I believe this is the pivot point of our life. You say, well, you know, Brother Jackie, the prophet Samuel was, uh, was sent from God to, uh, to anoint the next king. And I get all that. And I know. And, Lord, and you know what, Brother Jack, I've studied that. And I get all that. But, but you know what, I'm not a king. I, I'm not that. You could be wrong. Maybe you need to show up for church next Sunday because we're going to be talking about that. But I want you to take your Bible to Matthew chapter 22. Are you with me? Say amen. The Bible tells us in Matthew chapter 22, and if you'll notice in verse number 37, you'll see that, that all of a sudden, well, let's go back, and let's go back to verse number 34. Let's read there together. As a matter of fact, we can go all the way back to verse 33. As a matter of fact, we may even go any further. But let's look at Matthew chapter 27, and let's begin in verse number 33. Are you with me? Say amen. In verse number 33, you're reminded that in Matthew, there's a lot of things that are going on and there's a lot of things happening and there's foolish questions that are being answered, asked in Matthew chapter, uh, chapter 22. But look at verse number 33. And when the multitude heard this, they were astonished at his what? Doctrine. That is the basic beliefs of what he was teaching. 
Then in verse number 34, you find, but when the Pharisees had heard that he had put the Sadducees to silence, they were gathered together, didn't one of them, which was a lawyer, that is, he was intellectual, uh, he knew a lot of things, he was, he was a smart guy, he asked him a question, tempting him, saying, let's read verse 36 together, Master, which is the great commandment in the law. You can, almost, you can almost see that when he's asking that question, he's almost prideful in asking the question like, uh, you know what, 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 do you, what do you do? When you look at the law, what are you looking for? What is it that you're after? What is it that's going to present an outward presentation of what you're discussing here? And again, Jesus looks, man looks on the outward experience, but God looks on the heart and notice how Jesus answers him. In verse number 37, Jesus said unto him, Would you all read this with me? Thou shalt love the Lord thy God with all thy heart, and with all thy soul, and with all thy mind. This is the first and great commandment. Let's go back there because you guys didn't read it like you believed it. Verse 37, And Jesus said unto him, Thou shalt Love the Lord thy God with all thy heart, with all thy soul, and with all thy mind. This is the first and great commandment. The second is likened to it. Let's read it together. Thou shalt love thy neighbor as thyself. On these two commandments hang all the law and all the prophets. Do you notice the order? Did you notice the order that God kind of sets it up for? If you look at the order, it projects itself in, the, in, 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 in what's known as being authentic. If you look at the order, he doesn't say love everybody else first. He doesn't say be kind to everybody else first. He doesn't say, oh, you know what? You need to be nice to everybody and love everybody. And man, that, that's going to really propel you into a, into a walk with me. No. If you'll notice the order, he deals with the inside before he deals with the outside. You see it right there? He says, let's look at you on the inside before we look at what you do on the outside. And if you'll notice the inside of it, he says, you shall love the Lord thy God with, come on now, help me, all thy heart, with all thy soul, and with all thy mind. You know what God is doing? He's turning him inside out. He's going, let's look what's, on in, what's in you before we talk about what comes out of you. Let's think about that for just a moment. Just kind of focus in on this for a second. Are you with me? Amen. Verse 37, thou shalt love the Lord thy God with all your heart, with all your soul, your strength, with all your mind. You are to love God that way. Here's the question. Do you love God that way? Do you love God with all of your heart, with all of your soul, with all of your mind, with everything that's in you. Do you love him like that? Do you have an intimacy with him that is associated deep within you? That you can honestly say with everything in you, I love God, I love the Lord more than anything. Watch this. And I think this is a good acid test for you. Are you listening? Do you love him more now than when you first met him? Do you love him more now than when you did when you first met him? Because there's a lot of people that when they first meet God because of all the great things that God does for them, they are so excited about the transformation and the change in their life that they love God. But it seems as if the longer people are connected with God, in a lot of cases, the less they love Him. You know, when you think about this, there's three questions that I'm just going to kind of give you real quick. And this will kind of give us the acid test. So I want you to write these three questions down. 
When, it, when you think about verse number 37, this first question ought to cause us to really stop and ponder this. And we're going to do an exercise with it tonight. Are you ready for the first question? Here it is. Write it down. Do you know God? Do you know God? Not do you know about God, but do you know him intimately? For example, you may know about the President of the United States, but do you know him intimately and personally? It's the same thing with God. A lot of people today know about God. They know about Jesus, and maybe even they respect him above many others, but that's not the same as knowing him. Let, let me tell you why we're starting off with that one question tonight. And that is this, before we go outside and tell others the difference God can make in their life, and before we attempt to answer their questions about knowing God and knowing Him intimately, we've got to know Him ourselves. We've got to know Him ourselves. The question is, do you know God? Do you know God? Now, I want us to do some, something quickly tonight. Just kind of with me for a moment. Just stop where you are and bow your head all over this building. And as you bow your head all over this building, let me ask the question again. Do you know God? <clears throat> Do you know him intimately? Do you have a personal relationship with God. Is your life more about you than it is about Him? Has God become convenient to you? Have you been taking His relationship with you for granted? Are you desiring to know him more? Right now, with our heads bowed and our eyes closed all over this building, would you be honest with God tonight? If you have taken him for granted and you're not developing a deeper level of in intimacy with him, would you right now say, Father, forgive me for that? Father, I want you to forgive me for that. And, and would you renew your heart to him? Renew your heart to him that you would say to him tonight, God, right now in this sanctuary, I don't know about everybody else. It's not about everybody else. But tonight, God, I want to commit to you to love you with my whole heart. I want to love you with my whole heart. Not just not just with actions, not just with going through the formalities, but God, I want to love you with my whole heart. God, I want to know you. Your spiritual life has to be propelled from that moment. That your desire in your heart and in your life is not about just another religious experience. It's not about just attending church, but it's about knowing him. Knowing him. With our heads bowed and our eyes closed, this is not what we're going to do. But if I were to have an altar call tonight, right now, without any further statements at all, I wonder if you would be the person that would stand up and come to an altar and go, God, I haven't been loving you the way I should. And God, tonight, I want to love you in the right way. I wonder if that would be you. I wonder if it would be teenagers that would flood our altars or young adults or even senior adults that's been serving God for years that would say, God, I really have not been doing that, God. Lord, I want to love you. I want to know you. I want to desire an intimacy with you that I've never had before in my life. God, I want to go deeper with you. I want to experience you at another level. 
I wonder how many people would be stirred by the Spirit of God to go, God, I know you look on the inside. I can't hide from you. My love for you has become cold and calloused or common. And God, I, I need to change that tonight. I wonder if that would be you. Question number two is this. Are you with me? Not only do you know God, but do you know God's plan for your life? Do you know what God's up to with you? Do, do you know his plan for your life? Because I'm going to tell you, God has a plan for all of our lives. Do you believe that? And I want you to know that God's plan is to develop a, a relationship with you that, that far exceeds anything that you've ever had in your life. God's plan for you is to take you from where you are to where he wants you to be. The book of Jeremiah, I know the plans that I have for you, plans of good and not evil to bring you to an expected end. Have you forgotten, have you forgotten this? That God has a plan for your life that he wants to lead you to. That he wants to guide you to. I was talking with someone the other day about ministry and how what I'm seeing around the, around the world, really. <clears throat> and we were talking about how that God is working and what God's up to. And I said, you know what? <clears throat> it's, a, it's an interesting thought to me. But I don't really see this happening anymore in churches. I don't see men, young men coming down and saying, you know what? God's called me into the ministry. I don't see many people today submitting to the plan of God in their life. It's almost as if we're saying, no, we're not interested in God's plan for our life. We're interested in our plan, and maybe God will fit into that. My prayer today for our church is that God will start raising up young men and young women that will say to God, God, I want to be right in the center of your plan for my life. I want to commit myself to ministry. I want to commit myself to missions. I want to commit myself to be a leader in the school. I want to commit myself to be, to be one that's not going to be a quitter on our student ministry, but I'm going to hang in there, and I'm going to give it all I've got, and I'm going to serve God. And God, I know you have a plan for my life. Do you know him, and do you know his plan for your life. The plan to develop you and guide you and direct you into a place that when he gets you there, it's going to be great. It's going to be wonderful. You're going to find the fulfillment of that. It's almost as if we have forgotten that. I was telling Brother Benny the other day, according to the Southern Baptist statistics in the convention, are you ready for this? It is reported that 60% 60% of our Southern Baptist churches around the world did not baptize one teenager last year. 60% of our churches, the Southern Baptist churches, did not baptize one single teenager last year. Ladies and gentlemen, we're in trouble. We're in trouble in our world today. We're in trouble. Young people, listen to me. You just went on a mission trip. You just engaged. Listen, listen to pastor. Listen, listen to me. Our, our world needs y'all. Our world needs young people that will, that will fight the good fight, that, that will finish the course, that won't quit on God, that won't give up when it gets tough and hard. Our world needs our young people. Can I get an amen? We need people that can honestly say, I love God. And God absolutely has a plan for my life. And I'm going to tell you tonight, God has a plan for you. As Cassandra comes tonight for just a minute, I just want you to know this, that you cannot... Be what God wants you to be to others. Are you listening to me? You cannot be what God wants you to be to other, others until you become what God wants you to be to Him. You cannot be 
what God wants you to be to others until first you become what God wants you to be to Him. Is there room for improvement in your heart? Uh, let me ask you a question. Is there room in your heart for more of God? Is there room in your heart <clears throat> that when you really look deep in you and man looks on the outward appearance, but say it with me, God looks on the heart. If God looked on your heart, is there room in your heart to love God more than you do? It, do you have a little bit more room in your heart that you could say to God, watch this, God, fill up the rest of my heart with you. Is there room in your heart that you could say, God, more of you, less of me? Do you have room in your heart to say, God, I'm going to give you more of my heart. I'm going to give you more of my mind. I'm going to give you more of my strength. Until you can get to that place that you are experiencing the fullness of God personally, you can't go out there and show a world Jesus. It has to start in here. What if God were to turn you inside out tonight? Would he find room in your heart for him? So tonight, with every head bowed and every eye closed for just a moment, if God has spoken to you about your heart, and you would be willing to say, God, I want to give you more of me. I'm going to ask you all over this building to stand and come to this altar. Right now to your feet that you would say, God, I'm going to give you more of me. You just stand and come. God bless you, man. Others that are coming, you come. God, I want to give you more of me. <clears throat> right where you are, just stand up and come. All over the building, all over the balcony, everywhere. God, I'm going to give you more of me. I've got room in my heart for more of you. And I'm sorry that I have not done that before right now. But God, I'm going to do it tonight. I'm going to do it tonight. And Brother Randy, as you just sing, we're just going to open this altar up. And listen, if you don't know Jesus as your Savior, there will be somebody here that will help you with that. If you don't know Christ as your Savior and you'd like to invite him in your heart, if you would just raise your hand, there's going to be somebody that's going to come to you and pray for you and pray with you. And tonight, we're just going to take this moment. So let's all stand together as our altar are filled up tonight. What a great night to do that. What a great night to come to God. What a great night to say, God, more of you and less of me. Let's sing it together, Brother Randy. Let's do it right now.